Okay, before the opening of the Soviet archives, much written on the Communist Party USA's trade unionism during third period communism, has argued that the party's strategy of establishing revolutionary or red industrial unions affiliated to the CPUSA led Trade Union U Unity League as opposed to continuing to bore from within the American Federation of Labor Craft Unions through the party-led Trade Union Education League was a dismal flop. The opening of the Soviet archives has provided an opportunity to reevaluate this earlier perspective in the research literature. Although the CPUSA placed much of its focus from 1929 to 1934 on building the TUUL during this five-year period, it implemented a three-pronged approach regarding its trade unionism, including continuing to construct left-wing oppositions within the AFL unions, while also actively working to organize independent unions that were neither affiliated to the TUUL nor the AFL. While the TUUL unions had little success in organizing the heavy and mass production industries, these labor organizations were much more successful in organizing in light industries in New York City, where they organized the Trade Union Unity Council, especially after the June 1933 National Industrial Recovery Act's implementation. Besides its vigorous adv advocacy of a multiracial industrial unionism, the TUUL's conception of trade unionism was focused on encouraging the democratic rank and file participation of members that was dramatically different than that of the AFL, which believed that union officials should be the primary decision makers concerning union affairs. In analyzing TUU-led strikes conducted in various industries, including needle trades, textile, shoe, mining, agricultural, steel, auto, maritime, the time period industry and the size of the establishment in which the walkout took place affected strike success. Before the June 1933 NIRA's passage, strikes usually occurred spontaneously with TUUL cadre external to the strikers assuming leadership of the work stoppages with these strikes likely to have gone down to defeat. After the NIRA's implementation, league-led strikes were predominantly organized by TUUL UL members at the work site with the strikes in small shops in, in light industries likely to be victorious. While a number of TUUL unions, such as the Office Workers Union, the Railroad Workers Industrial League, and the Building Trades Industrial Union were either ineffective or paper organizations, the Needle Trades Workers Industrial Union as the TUUL's largest, most organizationally stable and most successful affiliate exerted an influence in, in advancing its program and leading strikes disproportionate to its size. The CPUSA utilized flexible tactics in constructing the union and in dealing with its AFL and in, and in its dealings with the AFL unions. As did the AFL needle trades unions, the NTWIU focused on the attainment of economic and trade union objectives such as obtaining wage raises, the reduction of work hours, recognition of shop committees, etc. Additionally, the NTWIU was moderately successful in the strikes that it led in many sections of the needle trades industry, while it was extremely successful in the fur industry where it was larger and exerted more power than the AFL-affiliated International Fur Workers Union. During the early 1930s, the TUUL recruited members through defensive strikes of unorganized workers that it led in opposition to slashing wages and speed up, although some walkouts conducted were for wage raises and improving working conditions. Since many strikes occurred spontaneously, the league unions could not adequately prepare and assume leadership once the walkouts had started, attempting to guide the strikes while recruiting members. Most strikes were defeated, although some resulted in real gains for workers. Strike success, however, did not always lead to membership gains and stability for the affiliated unions. A typical pattern emerged regarding most TUUL led strikes in this era. As the walkout's commencement, the CPUSA demonstrated much dedication and passion, although the utilization of violence against the strikers resulted in many defeats and the lack of stable unions. From 1929 to 1932, this description applied to the National Textile Workers Unions leading catastrophic strikes in Gastonia, North Carolina, and the Allentine. Allentown, Pennsylvania silk mills, as well as other league-led strike defeats among Tampa cigar makers, New York shoe workers, and Mexican agricultural workers in California Imperial Valley. 
The League's most vibrant union was the NTWIU, which had successfully engaged in united front tactics and led victorious strikes in 1931. The union's one chief weakness was that the party recognized was that its membership was concentrated in New York City with small locals of at most a few hundred members, each found in Chicago, Philadelphia, and Boston. Additionally, the NTWIU had failed to penetrate the industry's most important independent union, the amalgamated clothing workers, and in creating a united front from below with this union's members. The TUL unions were considerably healthier in New York City than in the nation as a whole. Operating under the name the Trade Union Unity Council from October 1931 to the middle of February 1932, the TUUC doubled its membership from 8,500 to 17,000. At this time, it led both defensive walkouts against wage slashing and offensive strikes for wage increases encompassing 11,000 workers with approximately 65% of the work stoppages deemed successful. Most defensive strikes were victorious, while the well-organized offensive walkouts, employers conceded wage increases as well as either the recognition of shop committees or the union. Various factors contributed to this success, including a more successful operation of the party's factory groups, opposition groups operating in the non-TUUL union, successfully utilizing United Front tactics from below, as well as trying to eliminate bureaucratic practices and organizational chaos from the inner workings of the TUUC unions. It should be noted that while the TUUL unions lost many strikes, large and small, during 1931 and 1932, these two years were difficult ones for all U.S. labor organization strikes. The balance of class forces, including the state's intervention on the side of capital, resulted in employers' refusal to engage in collective bargaining. The NIRA's implementation with Clause 7A, which provided most private sector workers with the legal right to unionize, resulted in a major growth of union membership among all unions affiliated with the AFL, independent unions, as well as the TUUL. However, Clause 7A's primary beneficiaries were the AFL and the independent unions rather than the TUUL. By July 1933, the League declared its membership to be between 50 and 60,000 and between 65 and 75,000 by August 1933. At the end of October 1933, the TUUL calculated a membership between 125, 125,000, and 130,000, with its largest unions being the NTWIU, which had 30,000 members. At the end of 1933, most TUUL members worked in shops of less than 300 employees. In companies where the TUUL was active, and 150 workers or fewer were employed, predominantly needle and shoe, most or all employees were lead members. In larger companies, more than 1,000 employees, such as steel or metal, virtually no TUUL members were present, such as at Hudson Motors, where just seven of 2,500 employees were auto workers union members. The highest percentage of TUUL members in a large steel or metal company was at Illinois Steel with 22 out of 1,000 employees being steel metal workers, industrial union members. The NIRA's implementation led to a tripling in the quantity of strikers from 1932 to 1933. TUUC unions were victorious in most strikes they led post-NIRA. Needle trades workers, about 35,000, including fur workers, bathrobe workers, custom tailors, and knit good workers comprised more than half the strikers. Wage raises of 20% to 35% were won in knit good, knits goods and bathrobe, while in the former industry, a 35-hour work week was attained, as was in fur. Union recognition also was achieved in bathrobe, while large pay raises were obtained in fur. Regarding TUUC strikes in the last six months of 1933, nearly all work stoppages occurred in light industries, with none conducted in the heavy industries, transport, railroad, marine, and heavy metal, which according to the CPUSA, these unions had trouble making inroads. Additionally, most strikes took place in small shops at most a few hundred workers, which were representative industries in which TUUC unions were most successful. Besides organizing red industrial unions, the TUUL also constructed communist fractions within AFL unions for attracting craft unionists to the league, in addition to conducting organized organizing work within independent unions. It was not until 1933 that the TUUL strategy within the AFL bore fruit. The June 1933 NIRA's passage expanded the TUUL's organizing work within the AFL unions beyond the needle and building trades 
to mining, metal, textile, marine, baking, printing, and railroad industries. Its most extensive efforts were in New York City, where the Red Federation had 1,200 CPUSA members and 50 important opposition groups within the AFL unions by the end of 1933. Post NIRA, the TUUL's deepest and most successful work remained in the needle and building trades among most crafts in the latter, including carpenters, painters, electricians, plumbers, bricklayers, and structural iron workers. For instance, the League's national movement encompassed 400 carpenters unions locals and 225 painters union locals, which endorsed the Red Federation's program. In needle, AFL work incurred in most large metropolises, with New York City's remaining the most successful. The League elected the leaders of various AFL needle trades locals with left-wing oppositions, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers and the International Lady Garment Workers Union being the most important, comprising 2,000 workers. Due to the League's increasing involvement with the AFL during 1933's last six months, the TUL participated more actively in AFL-led strikes. During most work stoppages, it compelled AFL leaders to elect strike committees of rank and file workers. Additionally, the TUUL leafleted and maintained daily contact with strikers throughout its agitation and propaganda while promoting its program at shop and mass meetings. Nationally, the TUUL experienced more success organizing with the AFL and independent unions after the NIRA's implementation is, and was leading four large independent unions which it hoped to bring into the league. The Tobacco Workers Union of Florida, 5,000 members. The Subpostal Workers, 4,200 members. The Hide Carriers Union in New York City, 800 to 1,000 members. And the Alteration Painters Union in New York City, 800 to 1,000 members by July 1933. Additionally, in smaller cities, the TUUL directed a a number of smaller independent unions, numbering a few thousand in metal, packing house, and building. Finally, the League's successful work organizing independent unions continued into the fall 1933, with it leading such organization in textile, 5,000 members postal, 4,000 members in packing, 3,000 members by the end of October 1933. So as opposed to the AFL's bureaucratic approach of delegating power to union officials, the TUUL sought to develop a more democratic activist or participatory unionism among its membership while attempting to address the unique concerns of young women and African American workers, as well as cultivating the leadership potential of these workers. These ambitious goals, however, were not always obtained. While the NIRA's implementation resulted in more TUUL-led strike victories, the League argued that in many walkouts, although the strike committees were organized on a democratic basis, these committees were more frequently engaged in agitation rather than leading the strikes, with the union's top leadership retaining control of the strike. Additionally, in many strikes, according to the TUUL, the specific demands of African-American women and young workers were not addressed, while leaders from these groups were not cultivated. Finally, TUUL affiliates did not confront white chauvinism among the workers during strikes as well as permitting African-American workers to earn lower wages than white workers for doing the same job. The Cannery Agricultural Workers Industrial Union was another TUUL affiliate which utilized multi-ethnic democratically elected farm committees while experiencing much strike success during 1933 when it, it achieved partial wage raises in 20 out of 24 strikes comprising 37,500 workers that the union led. Engaging in careful strike preparation, the union established democratically elected farm committees composed of each ethnicity for the mass meetings conducted in each growing district. Additionally, the May 1933 strike of the St. Louis Nut Pickers Union, a food workers industrial union affiliate at the Funston Nut Company utilized multi-ethnic democratically elected strike committees of African-American and white women workers who doubled their pay while achieving equal pay for the African-American workers, although they failed to obtain union recognition. Okay, so uh, three major victorious AFL strikes in 1934 were all led by left forces. The Mustyite led Toledo Autolite strike, the Trotskyist led Minneapolis Teamster strike, and the Communist led International Longshoremen Association strike in San Francisco, which resulted in the CPUSA Central Committee concluding in September 1934 
that the party had to strengthen its work in the AFL while continuing to build the TUUL. With Moscow beginning to implement the Popular Front, it called for a shift back to the AFL, which led to shutting down the league. Okay, so how can we evaluate the TUUL? Basically, the tr traditional perspective prior to the Soviet archives opening is that all of the TUUL affiliates were ineffectual and that all strikes led by the Federation were catastrophic losses. While it is undoubtedly true that many spontaneous strikes from 1930 to 1932 in which the TUUL assumed leadership were defeated, the Federation did provide representation and voice to workers largely ignored by the AFL. Never developing mass support in either heavy industry or in certain regions of the country, such as the South, research in the Soviet archives indicates that the TUUL did experience at least modest success in organizing and leading strikes in the smaller factories of New York City's light industries, specifically needle trades and shoe, in which the Red Unions utilized United Front from below tactics with rival union members. Moreover, the TUUL actively organized within both AFL and independent unions obtaining leadership positions and establishing thriving left-wing oppositions. These activities enabled the Red Unionists to force AFL officers to more aggressively conduct strikes while leading work stoppages of independent unions. Compared to the AFL, the TUUL sought to promote a more democratic activist and bottom-up unionism among all its members, including young women and African-American workers. While not always successful in achieving this goal, the League constantly advocated that its affiliates adopt this form of trade unionism. While the TUUL leaders often retained control of their unions and promoted their political agenda revolving around defense of the Soviet Union, they attempted to promote a more participative and inclusive unionism than that of the AFL. Although many TUUL unions were largely unsuccessful or were essentially paper organizations, the most successful affiliate was the NTWIU. A major reason for its success includes that it was based in the New York City light industries. However, other factors that contributed to the union's achievement was the flexibility of its approach, its ability to construct left-wing oppositions with the AFL, within the AFL Needle Trades Union and its effective utilization of the United Front from below policy during strikes. Although all of the needle trade workers sections did not achieve the same gains, the fur and dress sections were particularly successful. Upon the NIRA's June 1933 implementation, the Needle Trade Workers Industrial Union not only increased its membership, but it was particularly successful in the strikes it led while assuming a more noticeable leadership role in AFL needle trade strikes. Such an analysis should not apply that no problems confronted the Needle Trade Workers Industrial Union. Weaknesses included the union's relatively small size and that its influence declined dramatically outside of the New York City metropolitan area. Additionally, as with other TUUL affiliates, the Needle Trade Workers Industrial Union continually wrestled with activating African-American women, young, and non-party workers in the life and the leadership of the union. Okay, and let me just conclude now. It is necessary, however, to examine the TUUL's experience from a broader perspective. The organization offered CPUSA trade unionists an excellent opportunity to promote industrial unionism prior to returning to the AFL in 1934 and 1935. While the CPUSA's success in organizing the CIO unions during the mid to late 1930s is well known, its work in the TUL, TUUL enabled the CPUSA to achieve such gains. For example, the Needle Trade Workers Industrial Union's first section emerged as the foundation for the reorganized fur and leather workers union, which became the CIO's largest openly communist union. Moreover, the TUUL's emphasis on developing an activist rank and file shop floor structure aided the CPUSA in the organizing success in attaining the leadership of the 600,000 member United Electrical Workers. Finally, the CPUSA-led unions of the late 1930s and 1940s were more likely to practice a vibrant shop floor unionism than those unions not led by the CPUSA. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Okay. So we, um, there's a PowerPoint. For, yes. Yep. Yep. Great, thank you. So um, it's my pleasure to now introduce to you Eric McDuffie, uh, joining us from all the way from Champaign-Urbana, University of Illinois. The title of his talk, For a New Anti-Fascist, Anti-Imperialist People's Coalition, 
Rethinking the History of African Americans and U.S. Communism in the Age of Trump. Oh, in the Era of Trump. It's an age, it's an era. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, all right, very good. Uh, Randy, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and I'd like to thank Katie uh, Sibley and Vernon uh, Peterson for the invitation to be here. I also like to acknowledge, I'm sorry, and Jim Ryan as well. They're very good. I also like to acknowledge Maurice Isserman, who was my honors thesis when I was an undergraduate student at Hamilton College. Uh, I won't say how long ago that was, <laughs> but uh, thank you, uh, Maurice, for all your help and support over the years. And lastly, I'd like to thank and acknowledge Hank Payne. I don't know uh, if there are women's faculty here who knew him. He was a former uh, president here. He was a former president at Hamilton College when I graduated. He was very uh, supportive of me and, and helping me to graduate, and then he came here. Um, and then, unfortunately, he passed away a few years later. But I wanted to thank him and to acknowledge him. So, very good. So, uh, Carrie, are we good to go? There we go. Um, this piece is actually, in some ways, a, a, a thought piece. Um, in some ways, I'm thinking about the future of the field. And I'll be very upfront about this. This paper is very much informed by just my thinking about the contemporary moment, uh, the 2018 mid, uh, uh, midterm elections, Donald Trump, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. So in some ways what I'm trying to do in this paper is think about, chart future directions for the study of US communism. So my paper, a slight, a slight change in the title, for a new anti-fascist, anti-imperialist people's coalition, Claudia Jones, American Communism and the Politics of Possibilities in the Era of Trump. Black communist Claudia Jones was nervous and optimistic. She was convinced that the United States was on the verge of a fascist takeover during the height of anti-communist persecution across the country in the early 50s, a moment communists ominously called the McCarthy period. She frankly made this claim in numerous essays published during these years in the Communist Party's theoretical journal, Political Affairs. She pointed to the resurgence of lynching, a sexist backlash, virulent anti-communist persecution, and growing Wall Street power at home, together with US Cold War foreign policy, allegedly intent on crushing the Soviet Union and perpetuating colonialism across Asia and Africa as signs that fascism was near. But Jones remained hopeful. This optimism was most apparent in her 1952 essay titled For the Unity of Women in the Cause of Peace. She believed that the US masses, especially black working class women, under the leadership of the Communist Party would rise up and agitate, quote, for a new anti-fascist, anti-imperialist people's coalition, end quote. Her predictions may not have come true in the early 50s. However, her words of warning are arguably more relevant today than they were nearly 70 years ago. This paper examines the history and legacy of African Americans and US communism through the life and activism of Claudia Jones. She was the highest ranking black woman in the CPU, CPUSA and one of its leading theoreticians on the Negro question and the woman question during the Cold War years. She was also a political prisoner who endured persecution, incarceration, and deportation during the Cold War for her for her Communist Party affiliation. Until recently, she has been, as diasporic feminist scholar Carol Boyce Davies asserts, erased from the black radical intellectual tradition. In the last 10 years, scholars and activists around the world have rediscovered Jones, appreciating, appreciating her as an important black feminist foremother whose pioneering writings on trippy 
triply oppressed black women anticipated the black socialist transnational feminism of the Third World Women's Alliance and Kambahi River Collective. Still, there is much work to be done in examining the significance and legacy of Jones's life and activism. Today, I will make four interrelated arguments about Jones and her broader significance to the study of American communism, black radicalism, black feminism, Afri uh, the African diaspora, and our contemporary world. First, Jones's tenure in the US Communist Party sheds important insight into the freedom dreams of black Americans that prompted them to join and participate in the old left Communist Party. Second, she pro-offered a cutting edge anti-fascist politics that was radical, intersectional, and global in perspective through her journalism during the Cold War years. Third, her anti-fascist writings provide useful insight into current events, namely the rise of fascist, far-right, and white nationalist movements in the US and across the world. And lastly, through imagining the unimaginable, freedom for all people from racial, gender, and class oppression on a global scale. Jones Proffert advanced a politics of possibility for those of us interested in building a new world radically different from the one we have inherited. The early years and joining the Communist Party. Claudia Jones's entry into the Communist Party during the early 30s provides broad insight into the powerful attraction of communism to African Americans during the early and mid 20th century. She, like thousands of other black people who joined the uh, old left uh, Communist Party, did so not because they wanted to enlist in a conspiratorial movement or spy for the Soviet Union. Rather, they saw the CPUSA as a powerful vehicle for advancing racial equality, social justice, labor rights, decolonization, internationalism, peace, and to varying degrees, women's rights. Certainly this was true of, of the first blacks to join the Communist Party in the years immediately after the Russian Revolution and World War I. These included Harlem-based radicals like Otto Hooswood, uh, Cyril Briggs, Richard B. Moore, and Grace Campbell. Similarly, uh, it's the second generation of uh, black, uh, black communists like Jones who joined the party during the Great Depression, they, they joined it because they saw it as, again, as a powerful vehicle for fighting against racism, poverty, and imperialism. Jones was born Claudia Vera Cumberbatch in 1915 in Belmont, Trinidad. As a youngster, several relatives left the British Caribbean colony for the US in search of a better future. In 1924, she joined her family in Harlem, where she grew up. Instead of finding a land of milk and honey, Jones and her family, quote, suffered not only the impoverished lot of working class native families and its multinational populace, but early learned the special scourge of indignity stemming from, from Jim Crow national oppression, end quote, as she wrote years later. The tragic death of her mother from overwork and exhaustion uh, from toiling in a Harlem factory constituted a turning point in Jones's life. Looking back, Jones asserted that her mother's passing facilitated her early awareness of black women's triple oppression. Beyond her family, national and, uh, and global, uh, I'm sorry, beyond her family, national and global events facilitated Jones's radical political turn. Like thousands of African Americans across the Depression era uh, U uh, uh, US, the Scottsboro case of the early 30s was critical to bringing her into the Communist Party. The Scottsboro boys, as they came to be known, were nine African American young men, aged 12 to 21, who in March 1931 were falsely accused of raping two white women aboard a freight train en route from Chattanooga to Memphis. Authorities apprehended the youth near Scottsboro, Alabama, once there, they were tried by an all-white Jim Crow court. Eight of the young men were sentenced to death. In response, the CPUSA organized a worldwide amnesty movement demanding the freedom of the young men during the height of the Great Depression. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, the Scottsboro case came to, came to symbolize Jim Crow, lynching, imperialism, 
poverty, and racial oppression on a global scale. Due to the efforts of communists and their allies, the Scottsboro youth were spared the death penalty. Jones participated in Scottsboro demonstrations in Harlem. Communists led mass protests in New York City around the Italo-Ethiopian War, also radicalized her. Equally important, the utopianism and revolutionary promise of the Soviet Union appealed to Jones. Jones subscribed, uh, so, and, and then ultimately, she joined the Communist Party in 1936. In the coming years, her brilliance, passion for social justice, belief in the revolutionary possibilities of the global communist left, and her lived experience as an Afro-Caribbean working class female immigrant in the US propelled her into the highest ranks of the Communist Party leadership as the Cold War began. Jones, anti-fascism, black left uh, feminism in the Cold War. Claudia Jones, like thousands of US communists in the early 50s, believed that the US was on the verge of a fascist takeover. Additionally, many black Americans, radical and liberal, in the post-war uh, in the post-war years, a charge that African Americans faced genocide as defined by the United Nations. These fears were not unfounded. With World War II only a recent memory, the warm relations between the United States and Soviet Union quickly deteriorated. The Truman administration launched a policy of containment against the Soviet Union. Organized labor began to drift toward the right. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 radically limited the right of workers to unionize and required union officials to sign non-communist affidavits. On the racial front, civil rights groups distanced themselves from communists right after the war. Nationally, the post-war uh, post United States witnessed a surge in lynching and state terror against uh, black Americans. Um, a major riot in Columbia, uh, Tennessee on February 25th through the 26th 1946, triggered by a, a, an altercation between a black veteran and a white merchant, prompted white police and National Guard troops to kill two African Americans, arrest hundreds of black residents, and invade an African American neighborhood. The disturbance made headlines across the country. In the, in the Chicago suburb of Cicero, an, an, an enraged white mob numbering the thousands, viciously attacked a small number of African Americans who had moved into a lily white neighborhood in, in July 1951. Many of these riding whites denounced housing desegregation as communism. Overseas, African Americans fought and died in the Korean War at disproportionately higher rates than their white counterparts. Black women encountered virulent racialized sexual violence and state terror during these years, most notably Rosalie Ingram, a Georgia widow, mother, and sharecropper, and her sons who faced death for killing a white male would-be rapist. Her high-profile case made Mrs. Ingram a household name in, African -American, uh, in uh, the African-American community. Personally, Jones felt the scourge of state persecution. In 1948, authorities arrested her along with 10 other CPUSA national leaders for violating the Smith Act of 1940. The law criminalized calls for violently overthrowing the U.S. government. Neither Jones nor her comrades who came to be known as the CP11 issued such overtures, but anti-communist hysteria was in full effect and Jones suffered accordingly. Two years later, authorities arrested her for violating the Internal Security Act of 1950, the McCarran Act, which authorized the deportation of, foreign, uh, of the foreign born who were deemed as subversive. In 1951, she was charged again for violating the Smith Act. Authorities jailed her for nine months in 1955 before deporting her to Great Britain later that same year, with her health suffering immeasurably. She died at the age of 49 in 1964. That the state used her writings as evidence and de in, in its deportation case against her underscores how Cold Warriors viewed her journalism as subversive. It was within this context that she wrote about the right-wing turn in US life. I will examine her anti-fascist thinking in two essays, For the Unity of Women and the Cause of Peace and the Struggle for Peace in the United States, both of which were published in political affairs in 1951-1952, respectively. Both articles evidence the way she framed her calls for peace through a black 
through, I'm sorry, through her black left feminism, a path-breaking brand of feminist politics that, that centers working class women by combining black nationalist and American Communist Party positions on race, gender, and class with black women radicals' own lived experiences. Her own, her now classic essay of 1949, and then to the neglect of the problems of the Negro uh, a woman which I uh, posted on that PowerPoint, she argued that Negro uh, women as workers, as Negroes and as women are, th are the most oppressed stratum of the whole population, end quote. Turning orthodox Marxism on its head, she argued that black women across the African world, not white male industrial workers in the West, constituted the revolutionary vanguard for global transformative change. Given this position. She called on the CPUSA to fight racism and sexism toward uh, black women in the party and to move African-American women from the margins to the center for revolutionary change. This perspective was apparent in Jones's essay, Calling for Peace. She focused close attention to connections among racial terror, growing corporate power, labor unrest, and political repression at home with the Korean War, U.S. anti-Soviet foreign policy, and decolonization abroad. And for the unity of women in the cause of peace, she argued that triply oppressed African American women were keenly aware of the, quote, growth of terrorization, end quote, against black veterans, given that their sons and husbands were court-martialed and lynched after fighting in a conflict she perceived as an unjust war against a people of color fighting for national liberation. Additionally, she argued that, gr that the growing U.S. war economy hurt women, and especially black women, through speed-ups, automation, and downsizing, and the shifting of resources from social needs to war making. Even more, she argued that women around the world, due to their location as mothers and wives, recognize the danger of war to human survival. For this reason, the CPUSA needed to mobilize women, especially black women and other women of color in the United States in the cause for peace. In the struggle for peace in the United States, Jones made an even stronger case against war, fascism, sexism, and racial terror, contending that a pro-Wall Street, quote, bipartisan war coalition, end quote, and the Truman administration were hell-bent on destroying the Soviet Union and preserving European colonial empires. She expressed alarm at U.S. participation in the Korean War and the possibility of nuclear holocaust. Like prominent black radical spokespersons W.B. Du Bois and Paul R. Robeson, Claudia Jones was keenly aware that Jim Crow represented the Achilles heel in U.S. efforts to paint the Soviet Union as an authoritarian regime and to win favor with newly emerging nations of color in Asia and Africa. She wrote, quote, U.S. imperialism faced with ever rising and growing struggles from the oppressed Negro people within its own border must attempt to hide from worldview its own genocidal practices, fearful lest exposure further pulverize its shibboleth of a free nation in a free world, end quote. Third world people, Jones asserted, was taking notice of U.S. Uh, racial terror. For this reason, the struggle, quote, the struggle for peace requires a struggle against colonialism and the rejection of racist warmongering. And just to kind of cut, uh, to kind of get to the end, there's no question that Jones uh, romanticized the Soviet Union and overlooked its dark side, but it's important to keep in mind the, the time in which she lived um, and that the ways in which this lynching, race terror, war, uh, genocidal practices were impacting black people. So at one level, certainly, to support the enemy of an enemy made sense. I will end this paper by returning to Jones' essay, The Struggle for Peace in the, in the United States. In its conclusion, she called on uh, communist quote, to work to unite all people who understand that our country is in danger of war and fascism, end quote. Even though she and several of her close comrades faced imprisonment, deportation, and harassment, Jones was still confident about the future. She charged that, quote, the working class 
and Negro people led by the Communist Party would serve as a vanguard in propelling the U.S. towards, quote, happiness, security, equality, and peace, end quote. Scholars might quibble the fact that, that the dire picture Jones painted of the United States in the early 50s did not come true. They might also point out that a progressive interracial working class movement with people of color at the forefront is yet to fully materialize in this country. However, I would argue that Jones's prophetic words are coming true given the ascendance of fascism, white nationalism, and far-right movements in the U.S. and globally. And again, I think, and I'll cut right to it, that we can see, I think, in terms of fascism, that this hyper-nationalist, this, this, this call for a fictive uh, return, uh, appeal to a fictive ideal past, virulent anti-communism, uh, uh, racism, uh, scapegoating perceived domestic and foreign enemies, prom promotion of hetero uh, patriarchy, and, and obsession with crime and security, the distortions of fact and history, the control of the media. I think we can see this all not only um, in uh, Donald Trump's administration, but in right-wing forces across the world. So to wrap it up, and I, and I promise I am, this is it, uh, Dr. Sorch and company. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? How can we overcome this country's moribund fear of socialism and deep-seated white supremacy in order to chart a path forward as humanity faces immeasurable existential crises? What is our role as scholars of American communism? To ask these questions and to think critically about connections between the past, present, and future. What is for sure is that Claudia Jones's life provides a template for countering prevailing historical narratives that normalize empire, capitalism, white supremacy, and hetero patriarchy. Her incarceration, de deportation, and erasure illustrate what can happen, what can happen when left-wing radicals, especially women of color, speak out against authoritarianism and social injustice. Through her brilliance, resilience, and oversights, Jones enables us to not only to imagine that another world is truly possible, but to chart a path for creating a new one. This, I would argue, is the most important historical legacy of African Americans' encounter with US communism. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, so uh, next, next uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Vernon Peterson, uh, here from the University of Sarja. Uh, his talk is entitled, Fighting the Good Fight, the Communist Party and the Spanish Civil War. Give me a moment, they told me getting old would be fun. It would be a great part of my life. <laughs> People lie to me about lots of things. <laughs> All right. Uh, there are three things that the Communist Party gets a great deal of credit for uh, in its history and is often held up as examples of a uh, good impact of the party on American life. Uh, we just heard one of them, the party's resolute stance against racism. Uh, another is the party's support of unionism. And the third, and I think in some ways one of the more prominent, is the party's role in uh, providing soldiers to the Spanish Civil War. Uh, one of the reasons that the party receives so much uh, credit, and there's kind of this romantic aura about uh, American participation in, uh, in the civil conflict in Spain, is the veterans themselves. Uh, the members of the uh, Abraham Lincoln Battalion and the uh, short-lived Washington, uh, George Washington Battalion uh, came back to the United States after the war. They crafted a uh, narrative about their experiences that depicted themselves first as uh, premature anti-fascists, uh, which was a term that the uh, veterans themselves coined <laughs> uh, uh, in, uh, in regard to uh, what happened to them uh, during the period of the uh, Nazi-Soviet peace pact. And later on, they uh, turned the term to uh, use as a uh, as a weapon the government used against them uh, when it uh, discriminated against them during the Second World War as well. Uh, 
They depict themselves as idealistic, politically alert people who saw the menace of Nazi Germany before anyone else did and were determined to fight Hitler where he was, in this case, uh, in Spain. They downplayed the role of the Communist Party and communist ideology in their decision to go to Spain. They romanticized uh, the Republican side of the struggle. Uh, in particular, the Anarchist Party of Marxist Unification poem. And uh, they also uh, took a very rosy view of the gratitude of the Spanish people uh, to their actions. Now, what uh, surprised me when I began seriously researching this topic uh, is how little that uh, basic narrative that was crafted by the veterans themselves has changed in uh, the years since the uh, end of the Cold War. Uh, a couple of recent books uh, illustrate my point very well. Uh, number one uh, is a memoir by Eunice Lipton called A Distant Heartbeat. It's uh, the story of her attempt to find out what motivated her uncle, uh, David uh, Lipton, to go to Spain where he ultimately lost his life. Uh, in the introduction, she makes a statement that meshes beautifully with uh, what the veterans themselves said. She says, what drove my uncle and thousands like him to travel to a seething war-torn country? The answer is they sought to turn political outrage into concrete action to save Spain from the nightmare of fashion and to stop Adolf Hitler. Now, admittedly, uh, Lipton's work is a memoir, not a uh, scholarly work of history, but uh, her ideas are also echoed by uh, more scholarly and more uh, historic uh, works. The, uh, published in the same year as her memoir is Adam Hochschild's Spain in Our Hearts, Americans in the Spanish Civil War, which takes as its start uh, Peter Carroll's earlier work, uh, The Odyssey of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Peter Carroll's work uh, is based uh, very much on memoirs and testimony by uh, surviving veterans themselves, uh, and it does take uh, a more romanticized view. Uh, Hochschild, on the other hand, who has had access to more recent documents, access to some of the material coming out of Moscow, presents a much more gritty and uh, ambiguous tale. Uh, it concedes that uh, the veterans were not apolitical, but in fact were almost entirely uh, ideologically motivated members of the Communist Party. But it rejects the idea that party membership makes them any less heroic. Uh, instead, what he tries to do is portray their experiences as those of idealists with a strong belief in a moral mission, caught up in the complexities of the bloody reality of a civil war. Uh, again, no surprising these books take these points of view because they're largely based on memories of the veterans themselves. However, uh, there are other books uh, which take a much different point of view. The one that's most important to mention is Ron Radosh's uh, collection of documents, Spain Betrayed, the Soviet Union and the Spanish Civil War. Uh, these are taken out of the uh, International Brigade archives in Moscow. And uh, if you want to consult them yourself, a microphone version is available at the Tanamant uh, Archives in New York City. Radage presents a much bleaker picture of the war in Spain. Uh, the documents put to, to rest any lingering beliefs that the members of the International Brigades uh, were just concerned idealists. Uh, it documents the creation of the brigades by the Comintern, the recruitment of members by national level communist parties, and a careful vetting by those communist parties to ensure that only politically reliable individuals went to Spain. Far from being seen by the Spanish as the saviors of the Spanish Republic, uh, many Republican military officers saw the Brigadists as little more than mercenaries. As a consequence, they uh, received second-rate equipment and were used as shock troops, uh, a practice that led to a 53% casualty rate among the members of the Lincoln Battalion. Far from a clear-cut crusade against fascism, Radars produces documents demonstrating the Soviets put almost as much effort into countering uh, their perceived enemies on the left as they did Franco's armies, in particular the bloody suppression of Pohm uh, in Barcelona in 1937. And it's also hard to reconcile political idealism and anti-fascism with the plundering of the Spanish gold reserves under the pretense of paying for uh, Soviet support of the Republic. The discipline, or the, uh, the study of the American involvement in the Spanish Civil War needs to find uh, a new direction that can reconcile both the experiences of the veterans themselves, uh, the new material coming out, any more realistic vision 
of the Civil War itself. Uh, two actions, I think, are needed. Number one, uh, we have to stop idealizing the volunteers, either because they were on the right side of history or because they share our ideals and beliefs. We instead need to look at them as complex, flawed people acting in the context of their time. And number two, we need to discard the common conception of the Spanish Civil War as a dress rehearsal uh, for World War II or a noble crusade against fascism and find a model that combines a civil war with outside intervention and ideologically motivated volunteers. Living where I do these days in the Middle East, the civil war in Syria comes to mind. Both Spain and Syria exploded in the civil war because of deep dysfunctions within their own societies, compounded by changes in the countries round and about them. In the case of Spain, it was the collapse of its empire, but the retention of a social system structured on the reality of that empire, uh, compounded by the changes sweeping Europe in the aftermath of the First World War. Syrians, on the other hand, chafed on a dysfunctional society dominated by a religious minority and were caught up in a wave of change inspired by the Arab Spring. As for the interventionists, Germany, Italy, and the Soviet Union all intervened in Spain to gain advantages against international foes or to assist potential allies. In none of the cases were they directly, deeply concerned about what was going on in Spain itself. Uh, Hitler notoriously used the war as a smokescreen to cover his first round of territorial expansion in Europe, while Stalin used the war to burnish his image as a defender of progressivism, while at the same time he brutally suppressed all domestic opposition at home during the Great Terror. Iran and Russia have intervened in Syria to gain greater regional influence in the Middle East and uh, to wrongfoot uh, their opponents. They see Bashar Assad not as anyone they particularly care about, but as an extremely useful tool. In both the Spanish and Syrian wars, the United States could not recognize, reconcile dramatic differences in public opinion, and we largely stayed out. Although, ironically, in both cases, we sort of supported the rebels in both cases. Uh, for example, in the Spanish case, uh, Thorkild Reber, chief of Texaco Oil, sold oil and gas to the nationalists, despite the neutrality acts, uh, at absurdly cheap rates. Sometimes he just gave it away, and he also provided uh, the nationalist side in the war with valuable intelligence regarding the shipment of supplies to the Republican side. Uh, in Syria, American aid is more official, uh, and it also goes to the anti-government forces. Finally, and I think most significantly, in both conflicts, thousands of idealists from around the world rallied to the cause of the state, of a state because of the pull of ideology and the belief that a clear, clear evil must be opposed. I'm not suggesting a moral equivalence between uh, the jihadists involved, uh, bound to support the caliphate of the Islamic State and communists bound for Barcelona and Madrid, but I am saying that it is very useful to compare the experiences of these two groups in hope of gaining a more objective historical perspective. Now, this brings me back to my uh, first point, which is an attempt to re-examine the experiences and actions and motivations of the American volunteers in Spain. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually working on a project that looks at the members of the Tom Mooney machine gun company of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. Uh, who were uh, almost entirely uh, former members of the old Marine Workers Industrial Union. Uh, I am not, uh, there were dozens and dozens of men who served in the uh, Mooney Company. I'm not going to go through them all. Instead, what I want to do for the remainder of my time with you is to look at two of these individuals in particular, uh, a man named Joe Bianca and uh, a much more famous man, uh, Bill Bailey. In fact, he came up earlier, uh, earlier in the conference. Uh, looking at the Mariners is a very legitimate way of uh, finding a microcosm for American volunteers in Spain. Uh, the uh, veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, uh, brigade they call it a brigade, uh, it was actually smaller, uh, have a list of 253 Mariners who fought in Spain. Uh, there are some sources I've looked at which suggest the number may be as high as 400, 
which makes them the single largest occupational group of the uh, 2,800 American volunteers. They were also early arrivals in Spain. Uh, many of them uh, arrived in the very first wave of American volunteers around January of uh, 1937 uh, and fought throughout the entire conflict until the uh, disillusionment of the uh, uh, International Brigades themselves. The Mariners went to uh, Spain for a variety of reasons, uh, ferocious sense of militancy, convicted anti-fascism, loyalty to friends. Uh, interestingly, and in the case of uh, Joe Bianca, uh, disillusionment with the politics of the Popular Front. Uh, some of them found themselves in combat, some were horrified and disillusioned, and uh, my particular point, when they got back home, everybody reconstructed their memories to suit the needs of their post-war selves. So, let's have a look at uh, my first case study, uh, Joe Bianca. Classic example of a militant party member, union organizer, he thrived in the third period. He loved the rough and tumble uh, atmosphere of it. He loved the physical confrontations uh, with, uh, with the enemies of the working class. Uh, he was not able to adapt to the reformism and gradualism on the popular front. Uh, in particular, the uh, Marine Workers Industrial Union was one of the first of uh, the TUL unions dissolved by the uh, Comintern. Uh, in the wake of the uh, 1934 strike, in, excuse me, in San Francisco. Uh, in a lot of ways, it kind of uh, prefigured the coming of the Popular Front. Uh, they actually had a, co a conference where they all got together and drew up a resolution to uh, liquidate the union and then uh, scatter into the AFL unions. Uh, Bianca was one of the seven men on the executive committee who uh, actually drew up the articles of liquidation explained why it was important to change tactics, explained why it was important to work within the mainstream unions. But once they would gotten it all written up, uh, he was unable to sign it and refused. Uh, once a prominent leader on the waterfront, after the liquidation of the MWIU, he started going back to sea more and more. When he was on shore, uh, he did participate in the strikes, he did participate in demonstrations, he always hung back uh, in the background, uh, and he was uh, never particularly prominent. The coming of the Civil War in Spain gave him a brilliant opportunity to once again take direct action in a party cause. Uh, he was one of the first guys to arrive in Spain. I think he was there as early as January of 37, and he was a founding member of the Tom Mooney Machine Gun Company. He has been called in numerous sources, most notably Al Richmond's uh, long view from the left, as the best soldier in the Lincoln Battalion. And in fact, there's good reason for that. Bianca thrived in combat. He was fearless. He seemed to be utterly indestructible. He treated his fellow soldiers kindly. He helped them to adapt to the rigors of military life. Uh, he taught them little tricks to survive in camps, uh, how to build your shelter and make it waterproof, uh, how to survive on long forced marches uh, through the night and lighten up your pack without losing things you really, really needed. Uh, he did not question orders and he always carried them out. But on the other hand, he was a sailor. He had contempt for the officer class. Uh, he had no problem using extremely colorful language uh, to describe the poor food and the poor living conditions. Uh, he was an outrageously popular member of the Lincoln Battalion. However, Bianca has like another side, a much darker side as well. Uh, he was a violent drunk who went on shore, welcomed bar fights. He treated people he considered outsiders with contempt and he struggled with closeted homosexuality. When ashore and short of cash, he would go into waterfront bars and bet their patrons he could drive a long needle through his cheek without wincing. Oh yeah, he was able to pull this off because a knife fight he had had uh, in his youth had rendered one side of his face numb. <laughs> uh. Al Richmond, uh, who was working on the waterfront as a young communist organizer back in the day, remembered distinctly a night out with uh, Joe Bianca and another sailor named uh, Bill McHuston that nearly resulted in a brawl because uh, Bianca was stealing loose change off the bar. <laughs> uh, the uh, man whose uh, change Bianca had stolen uh, drug him outside. They were going to have a major fight when McHuston's girlfriend stepped in, separated the two men, uh, and shamed them into uh, going their separate ways. Bianca was very angry about this. He felt it wasn't the woman's place to interfere in a fight that he probably would have won. Uh, 
McHouston and the uh, young woman walk up ahead. Bianca and Richmond are uh, holding to the back. Uh, Bianca pulls out a long seaman's knife, uh, starts uh, sharpening it and saying he's going to cut the woman up. Absolutely horrified Al Richmond because he knew he was very serious. Uh, he was able to defuse the situation by diverting Bianca into another bar where they finished the evening sometime in the early morning. Almost every mention of Joe Bianca is accompanied by a comment about his close friend, lifelong pal, and partner, Al Kaufman, who uh, also went by the very uh, fanciful alias Oscar K. Everett. Uh, that Kaufman and Bianca were homosexual partners is extremely likely, although I don't you know, have any direct proof. Uh, the widespread acceptance of the relationship uh, under the pretense that they were just good friends is testimony to the careful and exhausting balancing act that both men performed. Kaufman was part of the same committee that liquidated the MWU as Bianca was. Unlike Bianca, he signed the resolution. He went to Spain as well, but not because he craved action, but because Bianca went. Uh, a motivation shared by lots of other men uh, who put themselves in harm's way, not have idealism, but they could not let down their friends. Uh, good, good God. <laughs> all right, we'll speed it up, because uh, I got to get through Bill Bailey first. Uh, all right, uh, in, Bianca, Spain, uh, in Spain, Bianca and Coffin uh, continued to mask their relationship very successfully. Uh, they actually served in different units. Bianca's in the machine gun company. Kaufman's in an artillery uh, battery. Uh, uh, Coffin is eventually killed, uh, which is very distressing to Bianca, who was killed four months later in a battle on Hill 666. Bianca went to Spain for uh, many reasons. The most important one was that he could be himself, that he was comfortable in all-male company, that he was accustomed to discomfort, and that the war allowed him to channel his darkest impulses into socially sanctioned violence. Now, uh, since I've only got a couple of minutes later, I will condense uh, Bill Bailey quickly. Bill Bailey is a great example of the reconstruction of memory. And in his case, there's an absolutely marvelous example built right into the memoir he wrote, uh, The Kid from Hoboken. The book is not about Spain a lot. Uh, he writes about being on a battlefield with uh, the dead all around him and smoking buildings. It's kind of romantic. Uh, the bit, though, that's really interesting is he devotes a couple of pages to talking about Stanley Posick. Uh, a young man who was one of the last of the uh, American volunteers to reach Spain, also a former member of the MWIU. Uh, Bianca depicts uh, Postic as this hard luck kid who shows up at the last minute clinging to the side of a resupply truck uh, and uh, has various uh, difficulties and adventures. Uh, participates in the Battle of the Ebro, is sent to the rear to the hospital, and then tragically when returning to the battlefront uh, to resume the fight, uh, the truck he's riding is struck by a shell uh, and Postic is not killed but blown up very badly. Uh, and winds up trapped in Spain when the uh, international brigades are withdrawn. Uh, Bianca then talk, I mean Bianca, excuse me, uh, Bailey then talks about a, uh, an elaborate plan how he wanted to go to uh, France to rescue Pia uh, Postic from an internment camp. Now, this is all a really great example of the romanization of the Spanish Civil War. What's interesting is it's not true. Uh, Postic left a detailed diary of his experiences in Spain, which was never published, and I stumbled across in uh, the Tanman archives uh, doing completely unrelated research. Uh, Apostic tells a completely different story. Uh, he arrived in Spain uh, with uh, one of the regular uh, one of the regular contingents of troops, uh, trained as normal in a camp, uh, bumped in, did go to the hospital when he hurt himself in basic training, bumped into Bailey uh, after he got out of the hospital. He was unhappy because he'd been put in a Canadian uh, battalion. Bailey got him transferred into the Tom Mooney Brigade, uh, where he was for several weeks before they crossed the Ebro River in the last great offensive of the war. Postic served all the way through uh, the advance and then the retreat back to Hill 66. Uh, he wasn't returning from an injury when he was inadvertently uh, blown up, but in fact had gone down to the base of the mountain to unload a food truck when in fact he was hit by an artillery shell and uh, badly blown up. He did uh, manage to escape from Spain just ahead of uh, Franco's armies 
and spent some time in a uh, concentration camp, uh, concentrated in internment camp. But uh, he was only there a week, uh, so Bailey could not have heard about it in the States and then uh, made up an elaborate plan to sail to France to rescue him. Uh, and just to, uh, to cap it off, and my apologies, um, Bailey also mentions that at one point in the, uh, in the fighting in the war, uh, a reporter who was visiting the lines popped up too high above the trenches, and it was Stanley Postick who tackled him and saved his life. Yeah, you know, it was Ernest Hemingway. Except Postick doesn't mention meeting Hemingway at all in his journals, and knowing Stanley, he certainly would have. Uh, <laughs> Bailey's not deliberately lying. Memories can become confused. Separate events can become condensed over time. What he is guilty of is romanticizing his memoirs to conform to the way he chose to frame his experiences after he came home. It's time for us to start seeing the Spanish War as a complex event, combining domestic dysfunctions with opportunism by intervening powers, stop looking for heroes and villains, and start talking about historical actors. Great. Um, so last but not least, we have uh, William Pratt, uh, who is a uh, professor his of history emeritus from the University of Nebraska at home Omaha, who will be talking to us about communists and farmers. And we're going to be loading a PowerPoint, hopefully. Uh, I am really glad to be here. There were moments yesterday, several moments yesterday I never thought I would get out of airports. And I, I got here at 10 o'clock last night, and you can't imagine how satisfying it was to get here after the day I went through. So. The topic of communist and American farmers has received relatively little attention from historians or communists themselves. Yet for a fuller understanding of the American communist experience, it is important to acknowledge that some communists tried to organize farmers and that such efforts may have amounted to something at times and places. Lowell K. Dyson's Red Harvest, the Communist Party and American Farmers, was a good start on the serious study of this topic and should be recognized as a solid contribution to what we know of those efforts. Dyson tracked down former participants, interviewed them, and sometimes persuaded them to share correspondence and other items. His pioneering study on the overall topic of communist and farmers covers the waterfront from the early 1920s well into the 1950s. And his work is essential reading for students of American communism and farm movements in the United States. Yet Lowell's book was published back in 1982, more than 35 years ago. Since that time, while many old timers who took part in communist farm efforts are no longer with us, important new sources have become available that can provide additional detail, new perspectives, and corrections, or at least clarifications, what we know of the history of American communism. The most remarkable source for many of us was the opening up of Communist Party records in Moscow in the 1990s. Materials sent from the US for safekeeping decades earlier now became accessible to researchers willing to travel to Moscow. Then within a decade, the Communist Party USA collection, some 4,000 files became available on microfilm at the Library of Congress and other research libraries in the United States. A second source that opened up before the Moscow holdings was the massing, massive FBI archives on God knows how many people and organizations. <laughs> For more than two decades, a researcher could make a Freedom of Information Act request. And if carefully worded by the researcher and conscientiously complied with by the FBI, large amounts of useful information might be released. I certainly have benefited from those releases. But I do not want to romanticize the good old days of FBI FOIA compliance. However, 
as on one occasion, it took more than 10 years to obtain a particular file. My impression today is that the FBI does not comply with either the spirit or the plain meaning of the language of the Freedom of Information Act. My point here is that FBI releases used to be very helpful in studying communist efforts in agriculture from the World War II era well into the 1950s. My presentation today deals uh, seeking to answer a question. What does the topic of communist and farmers amount to? And for that, I see three things that are noteworthy or important. One, the farmer labor era is important to understanding what happened to the party in the 1923-24 era and its relationship to the 1924 Robert La Follette presidential campaign. Two, communist involvement with the farm revolt of the 1930s, which helps illuminate the larger topic of farm protest in the Depression, as well as elaborating on the ramifications of the third period in party history. And three, popular front in agriculture, especially in the 1940s. Communist involvement in the left liberal coalition in agriculture meant working with the farmers' union. And communists often worked with that organization closely until 1948, or until the 1948 Wallace campaign, and especially the outbreak of the Korean War. But the Popular Front in Agriculture, especially in the 1940s, was the last time that communists had any significant influence in agriculture. I'll turn to the farm labor era. The party leadership was divided into two basic groups, 1923, 1924. One group around Charles Ruthenberg and John Pepper, and the other around William Z. Foster and James Cannon. Farmer laborism was in the air in 1923, 1924. Ruthenberg and Pepper wanted to take advantage of that. They helped organize farmer labor parties at the state level, South Dakota, Montana, uh, North Dakota. They wanted to work with the existing farmer labor movement in Minnesota. Through the maneuvers of Pepper, the party took over a 1923 Farmer Labor Convention in Chicago and orchestrated the formation of the Federated Farmer Labor Party, which they hoped would lead to bigger things. Unfortunately for their wishes, this effort was identified as communist and, and many people um, that had supported it initially had dropped out. There is a lot of farmer labor interest out there that wants to create a national third party and run Robert La Follette as its presidential candidate. Ruthenberg and Pepper were very much in favor of forming a national farmer labor party, but they didn't want La Follette as a candidate. Ruthenberg said, however, that if such a national party was formed, and if despite communist objectives, that party nominated La Follette, the party would still support this. Foster and Cannon were upset with the direction of the party, especially on that issue. And both groups appealed to Moscow. In Moscow, uh, Foster says that Ruthenberg and Pepper, they placed too much emphasis on farmers and not enough emphasis on workers, and at one point in time, they said that's basically what they want to organize, farmers. There was little sympathy for that kind of talk in Moscow in mid-1924. And the Russian Politburo, through the Comintern, stopped the farmer labor maneuver in its tracks, La Follette or no La Follette. And this caused the American party to be more isolated than it had been before, because they had done a lot of groundwork in trying to build up farmer labor effort. The party ran Foster and eventually Gitlow, uh, but it was pretty much a disastrous development. Uh, 
Moscow's involvement in this particular episode is, is quite significant. It's not the first time they intervened by any means. It wouldn't be the last. But the failure to create a farmer labor party or a third party nationally outside the two-party system was the last chance, perhaps in retrospect, to build a viable alternative to a two-party system. You couldn't <coughs> blame all of this on Moscow as La Follette's unwillingness to back the formation of a third party that plays a role. But this is a noteworthy intervention. The farm revolt of the 1930s amounts to the last major farm insurgency in American history. And some communists were very much involved in this development. Most people, including historians, will date the insurgency to the emergence of the farmer's holiday movement. But the farmer's holiday movement begins in 1932. And a year before the holiday broke out, this is one of my flaws, it did work. <laughs> Once. A year before the holiday appeared on the scene in 1932, communist-led efforts in the upper Midwest and in Alabama sought to protect farmers from forced sales and evictions. This particular story relates to something on the Upper Peninsula, and I think it's dated December 4th, 1931. The United Farmers League stopped sheriff sales and organized demonstrations to pressure local authorities for relief. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan, northern Minnesota, and northeast Montana. In the Great Lakes region, the United Farmers League in 1931 and 1932 is pretty much a Finnish operation or a Finnish enterprise. In fact, in that era, there was a Finnish farm revolt of the 1930s before the holiday. There was widespread farm protest, 1932-1933. But when the farmer's holiday emerged by the fall of 1932, United Farmers League was overshadowed. Holiday people planned marches on state capitals in early 1933. I just mentioned that this is, a, that's Finnish language, so they actually were recruiting among Finns in the Upper Peninsula and in Minnesota, northern Wisconsin. These marches on state capitals uh, were to promote a moratorium on farm foreclosures. This is a scene from Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, when one of the participants was shown a book with that photograph in the 60s, they said, well, where's the rest of it? <laughs> on the right side of the photograph, there's about as many farmers in the original photograph. But this is the one that uh, has been preserved. And you, you can't read these signs, but there's all kinds of messages there. They didn't take role at these demonstrations, so all kinds of people could show up, you know, workers of the world and so forth. And there's actually an anti-Semitic sign in the back there that was not promoted by <laughs> the people who were organizing them. The meeting. Communists participated in the holiday in many locales, sometimes assuming leadership roles. In fact, there were more communists and their allies taking part in the broader based holiday movement than in the United Farmers League. Two of the key people in the Communist Party farm effort in the 1930s were Hal Ware, who earlier had been involved in organizing farmers or trying to organize them in the 20s, and then he also was very important in the introduction of tractor farming in the Soviet Union. Later, he has a more clandestine side to him, involved with the Ware Group. You didn't hear about the Ware Group until after World War II. The Ware Group will be involved in espionage. 
early, let's see, in October of 1932, there was an effort in Nebraska where uh, a particular version of the holiday uh, emerged. It was holiday Madison County plan. In early October, they went out and repossessed two repossessed trucks and then took a large number of farmers to a farm sale, conducted what was known as a Sears and Roebuck sale. They didn't allow anybody to bid except the bidding committee. They sold all the livestock off for a grand total of $5.35, took up a collection, gave the money to the widow whose farm was under risk, and that resolved it. That was the first of those episodes in Nebraska, but some of them had already occurred uh, elsewhere in the country. You know, a key message that the farm revolt people promoted was stop foreclosures. You know, it was really a direct action phase. That particular scene, perhaps as many as 4,000 showed up uh, for the demonstration. Hal Ware and uh, an associate, Lem Harris, developed an alternative to the United Farmers League. They were hoping to encourage farmers and local groups to unite on immediate issues. This would be a united front or a united front uh, from the bottom. They formed an umbrella group called the Farmers National Committee for Action. United Farmers League theoretically was more ideological. It was closer to the party. Whereas the Farmers National Committee for Action people, they were supposed to be a looser group and work on particular issues. Keep in mind, though, that either of these two approaches are being organized during the third period, which has its own particular constraints. There was a lot of farm protest in the 1932 and well into 1933. But then New Deal farm programs began to kick in. And they had the effect of undercutting protest, whether it's orchestrated by the mainstream of the Farmers Holiday Movement or the United Farmers League or other groups that might be influenced by communists. You know, the New Deal generally undercut left-wing efforts in this country you know, across the board. And they certainly play a major role in reducing farm protest. Party functionary from those days told me in the 1980s comments of a local comrade. What the hell do we need the Communist Party for? We have the Democratic Party now. There was a communist farmer in Roberts County, um, South Dakota. By late 1935, United Farm leaders urged their members to join the Farmers' Holiday or the Farmers' Union. You know, the third period is over. The Popular Front is emerging. It was only a matter of time before the holiday itself will be absorbed into the Farmers' Union. Now, we see that discussion in a number of scholarly accounts. What does need to be pointed out, however, is many of those participants in the United Farmers League, and certainly in the Farmers' Holiday, earlier had belonged to the Farmers' Union. I talked to a, a left-wing uh, farm activist from the 1930s when he was in a nursing home. He had never been a communist, I don't think, but he had worked closely with them at times. He said the holiday was the Army and Navy of the Farmers' Union. Well, the farm revolt of the 1930s had been over for some time, and communists and their allies had to adjust to the challenges of a new era. But here is a, a cartoon from that earlier era which evokes what United Farmers League and what the holiday uh, sought to do. You know, trying to stop evictions. And one of the benefits of that farm revolt of the 1930s was the buy time. The buy time for farming. 
Okay. Whatever else can be said about this episode in the 1930s, the, pop, the party now probably had a greater following in the countryside than it had prior to the Depression. And despite numerous setbacks and false starts, some of its membership gains would persist well into the post-World War II era. And the popular front in agriculture, as I said before, this is communist involvement mostly in regard to the Farmers' Union. And the Farmers' Union was the most important liberal farm organization. It was a family farm organization, summer camps, education programs, cooperative grain elevators, cooperative gas stations. It was a big deal. In the immediate post-war period, as the Cold War is starting to uh, percolate. Farmers Union was part of a left liberal coalition. Its president, James Patton, was a national figure and he emerged as a strong critic of the Truman administration on both domestic and foreign policy issues. He was particularly critical of the Truman Doctrine. There were some communists involved in the Farmers Union. Some of them held important positions in state affiliates. Einar Quivenin in Minnesota was elected and re-elected president of the Minnesota Farmers Union. Uh, Alvin Chrisman served as president of the Eastern Division. Quite a bit of um, involvement at the local level. Lem Harris was a fixture at National Farmers Union meetings and covered farm issues for the CP press. And the red issue surfaced, and it, it served to create a certain amount of disruption. Uh, the Wisconsin Farmers Union in early 1948 fired a husband and wife team from its staff. The president became a strong proponent of an anti-communist membership provision, but the National opposed such a litmus test when we resist the Wisconsin initiative for years. 1948 Henry Wallace campaign, however, provided some of the final solvent for the left liberal coalition with its most definitive impact on the CIO. But Patton refused to support Wallace, though he had been a strong supporter of him earlier. He was afraid of what the effect would be of a third party on Congress. Glenn Talbot, of the, the president of the North Dakota organization, might have voted for Wallace, but stayed nothing publicly. Only the president of the Iowa Farmers Union, the president of the New York, uh, the Farmers Union, New York Milk Shed, and the Eastern Division, which was Pennsylvania and New Jersey, they were the only ones that publicly backed Wallace. You know, the Wallace campaign separated the sheep from the goats and the left of left of center groups, one after another. But it's the Korean War that really brings uh, the end of the grand left, uh, the Farmers Union kicks out the Iowa organization, the Eastern Division, I'm gonna have to speed up a couple things here. CP continued to have an interest in farmers, but the prosecution of party leaders, the move of key cadre to the underground, and the growing disillusionment on the part of many rank and file made it virtually impossible to regroup rural people. Here and there, some remnants of communist support among New Jersey egg farmers or Dakota wheat farmers, and we can see this into the 1950s. And we might see some uh, left-wingers in uh, Finnish co-ops, but virtually no organized party activity aside from subscriptions to the daily worker or the worker, payment of dues, perhaps an occasional visit from a party functionary. As a practical matter, the communist effort in the countryside had played out years before. All that was left were memories, some of which I have tried to tap from time to time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh,
I'll use it. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your wonderful presentations. We have some time to take some questions. Yes, John. I have a question for Eric. Eric, I was wondering if you could expand on something that you said sort of quickly towards the end of your talk there. Uh, when you said that Claudia Jones um, in the Cold War period recognized racism as the Achilles heel for the United States, and, I'm, and when you said that, it made me immediately think about Mary Dudziak's work on the Cold War imperative where she's essentially arguing that US policymakers are having that same recognition, but obviously that leads to some very different conclusions. And I, so I was wondering if you could put your work in conversation with that, specifically on this recognition that Claudia Jones seemed to have and what it means when that recognition is coming from someone like Claudia Jones as opposed to someone like Dean Ash. Sure. Um, well, you know, I'm always intrigued at one level, and, and thank you for the question. So how often we talk about this question uh, Jim Crow, U.S. racism being the Achilles heel of the U.S., and we cite uh, Dudziak, uh, Mary uh, Dudziak. I think the scholar that we really should cite is Gerald Horn. Um, by far, uh, he's the most prol prolific scholar of uh, blacks and communism, and I think really one of the most important scholars of U.S. communism. Um, as uh, Gerald has argued, as I would, um, and of course, folks, during that time did Du Bois, Paul Robeson, uh, Jones, they said, look, you know, um, the US uh, government is keenly aware of how it's being perceived overseas, um, especially in Africa and Asia, and the US cannot uh, frame itself as being as a democratic uh, country fighting against the evil Soviet Union with black folks being lynched and, and raped and so forth and so on. Um, and I, th I think there's now, there's, uh, there's credible, there's more than just credible evidence that shows that yes, I mean, uh, U.S. state policy makers were keenly aware uh, and that, that civil rights reforms were given in response to the uh, global uh, uh, situation. So thank you. Yeah, Dan. Um, I thought there were some interesting parallels between the uh, presentations by Dr. Crown and Dr. McDuffie, but it seems that with the shift of the Democratic Party to the right with the Cold War, with the, you know, the defeat of Wallace and the rise of Truman, that both you know, African-American activists and white farmers in rural America were sort of left without a political home in some ways, that you know, if you were a leftist, you could be part of the Democratic Party. I mean, the Democratic Party was shifting right, so what, where was your home at that point? I also think it's interesting that, I mean, you're showing crowds supporting Trump, and, you know, Trump's very popular in rural America now. You're talking about how rural Americans are supporting the left. How do those things sort of intersect? Well, I think you need to be cautious in assuming how extensive uh, communist influence was in the countryside, and it varies from place to place. There are some sections of states that had a long history of left-wing activity. Northeast corner of South Dakota. They had a socialist movement there. When the Nonpartisan League came along, that was there. They had a farmer labor party in the early 20s that took over the courthouse. And so when they have uh, communist efforts in the 1930s, it's kind of like fulfilling uh, your father's traditions. And we can spot to some other places like to Madison County, Nebraska, uh, Sheridan County, northeastern uh, Montana, uh, places uh, on the Iron Range. But there's also uh, a lot of resistance to these kinds of efforts, too. But you ask, where, where do they go? You know, some of these people did go. They left during the Depression and went to the West Coast. Uh, there were people that, uh, you know, this is a time of a very slow urban growth in the population. But there's people that often leave the countryside in one part of the country and go somewhere else. Oh, well, this 
point of what happens to the farmer uh, labor movement. In your talk, you mentioned the uh, direction from the common term, that the common term were turning the party, American party, away from support that, that movement. Is that critical? Well, you, I, well, first to go back to why did the common term do that? Uh, it's really a fuss within the Russian party, and you know Trotsky's in the middle of it. Trotsky has a strong uh, pronouncement: "No farmers in the Communist Party." Okay, well they kind of confuse farmer labor party and Communist Party too. But I think to help, not to do anything that provides any support to Trotsky whatsoever. He's like, hey, no farmers in the American Party. Stay out of that. I didn't say don't have them in the party, but don't get involved with a farmer labor effort. I, I don't, you know, it's one of those cases where, as a practical matter, uh, if they hadn't done anything, it wouldn't have had a whole lot more effect on the American party in this case. You know, there are times when the common turn intervened. You know, they got the Communist Party to become a party. I mean, you had two, three different elements out there. You say, hey, you gotta have one party. And that was beneficial to the American Party. But there's a lot of times, other than that 1924 episode, that the common turn decisions didn't have much effect in regard to what happened with the American Party and farmers. You know, what happens in the rural areas, and I was thinking about this, yesterday and today, there's hardly any party discipline in the countryside. You know, you might get brought up on charges in New York or Bayonne or somewhere, but they didn't bring you up on charges in uh, rural Montana, unless you came out for Trotsky. I mean, I, I, grant, on, <laughs> I grant on that one. <laughs> but uh, there were people who were, in, they were sent to work in plenty of women. said, we don't want to be here anymore. We're going to go to New York. And they remain in the party the rest of their lives. You gotta go to plenty. I don't wanna go to plenty. But it's amazing <laughs> in the ag sector how little actual party discipline there was. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't true in the other areas, but I'm just saying in, in rural America, it didn't seem to be a lot of discipline. Yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, uh, point to any overall Um, I, yeah, and, and uh, Tim Johnson has a piece in Science and Society on the, the Sharecroppers Union, too. I think there is, uh, I was hesitant to, to try to get into it because of how much time you have to work with things. But, yeah, the third period was a time when there's a lot of interest in doing something with farmers. I don't want to exaggerate it. I had a quote here. I want to make sure I say it right. Well, I'll come up with it. Uh, I thought about entitling my paper, it looks like the American, you know, it looks like the Communist Party of America is afraid of farmers. <laughs> That's a comment that a functionary wrote to, to the center in 1931. You, it was hard to get the attention of key people in the National Party to really deal with the rural areas. And it certainly was the case in the 20s. Now in the 30s it, it does change, but still it's an urban movement. And it's hard to get across the point that farmers also belong in the party. You know, they're bourgeois. Why they might even hire somebody at harvest time to help? You know, they're employers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I'm sorry, Ed. Just one more uh, question. Oh, okay. Just a quick question. You said about um, the, the famous holiday people fighting the evictions, which to buy time. Um, what happened? Like, did the sheriff come back in a month and do the sale again? Uh, well, first, in 1933. Or a number of state legislatures do pass a moratorium law, which is sort of is a postponement of uh, foreclosures. And when I talked about time, that also gives the government time to respond to some of these pressures. 
part of the background of New Deal farm programs in 1933 is all the ferment that was in the countryside late 32 and early 33. You know, Roosevelt doesn't become president until March. Well, by March, there had been an awful lot of protests out there for months, and it got national publicity. Sorry, one more, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting you bring up John Pepper, who, as far as I'm aware, was an ally of Lovestone, right? And there's, so, and you're talking about 1924 and this, you know, desire to build some kind of united front third party. This is the same time that Bukharin is at his height in, in the Soviet Union, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about the right opposition in the U.S. Um, well, first, the Lovestone's going to be around uh, until 29. But uh, one of the, Pepper apparently was an extraordinarily able guy. His enemies concede he was able. They didn't want him. And part of the deal with Foster in Moscow is to get Pepper recalled. And Pepper goes to Moscow and he doesn't come back in 1924. <laughs> they gave him another job. And he doesn't get back in the States till. I don't know, maybe in 29, and he, he's not a real factor in the Communist Party politics anymore. But yeah, uh, there was a similarity on some things with Bukharin. Lovestone is a funny guy. When you read people's correspondence, it doesn't always match up with the image that historians have projected in their writing. He apparently was a very manipulative guy but he could write an ingratiating letter. And, you know, the Finnish cooperative movement would provide a lot of contributions and money and stuff. And after Lovestone's removed, then the party says, give us money. Before, he said, here, do you need some money? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm exaggerating the point, but uh, Lovestone's letters are not, they're very interesting, and they have detail. Now, I, I don't know about, was it, the Communist Party opposition. I don't know what happens there. And as what happens with a lot of these people is they are outside the party. They eventually, they're anti-American party, they're anti-Stalin, and after a while, they become anti-communist, despite their name, and anti-socialist. Okay, well, we're going to take a little break, and so you can follow up one-on-one, -on -one, just about 15 minutes until our next panel, so stretch your legs, and thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah.